All right, we're going to get started here in mere moments. Do you know? Um, um, oh no, sorry. I thought you were doing it this afternoon. Okay, we're going to continue on with the uh, second uh, portion of our land claim uh, panel. Unfortunately, um, Harry Slade is not able to make it due to personal uh, reasons that uh, he had to cancel at the last minute. Um, so I, he did provide a bit of a briefing uh, on what he was going to talk about, so I will read that when I'm finished reading um, the bios of our panel, including Harry, who's not here. The Honourable Harry Slade, QC, Chairperson, it's hard to read, it's so dark. Um, Chairperson Justice Slade was initially appointed to the Specific Claims Tribunal in November 2009. He was appointed Chairperson in December 2009 and reappointed for a five-year term in November 2010. He has since be, been reappointed Chairperson for two consecutive five-year terms, the most recent of which began in December 2015. Justice Slade was admitted to the bar of British Columbia in 1974. His primary area of practice as a lawyer was Aboriginal law. He was active in the advancement of Aboriginal rights issues where his work included intergovernmental relations among First Nations, Canada and the provinces, including treaty processes, self-government initiatives and commercial development of reserve lands. As a lawyer, Justice Slade also worked with First Nations on ventures in forestry, fishing and energy and resource development. He practiced law at Ratcliffe and Company, a North Vancouver law firm with an extensive Aboriginal environment mental law practice. Justice Slade was appointed Queen's Counsel in 1998 and became a Justice of the, Vancouver, or the British Columbia Supreme Court in March 2001. All right, our other bios. Mr. Douglas Aford, a graduate of the University of British Columbia Faculty of Law, was admitted to the British Columbia Bar in 1991. He has broad experience in civil litigation matters and has appeared as a trial and appellant counsel at all levels of court in British Columbia, as well as regulatory and administrative tribunals. He also has experience in alternate forms of dispute resolution, representing clients at arbitrations and mediations. Mr. Aford provides strategic business and legal advice to First Nations, the Crown and industry about transportation infrastructure and resource development projects. He was a chief federal negotiator for the Government of Canada in the comprehensive lands claim process in British Columbia. In 2013, the Government of Canada retained Mr. Aford to provide advice about Aboriginal participation in the development of oil and natural gas pipelines and related infrastructure in Alberta and British Columbia. In 2014, Minister of Aboriginal Affairs and Northern Development appointed Mr. Aford to lead the engagement with Aboriginal groups and key stakeholders for the review and reform of the comprehensive land claims policy. Okay, now on to Ryan Shackleton. Ryan is the founder and director of No History Inc., Canada's leading historical research firm. He's been a professional consultant for almost 20 years and has completed hundreds of public history projects for all levels of government, Indigenous organizations, nonprofits, corporations, and individuals. He is a published and peer-reviewed author with specialization in Métis and Arctic histories and frequently lectures at universities and conferences. Ryan holds an MA degree from Carleton University, is co-chair of the National Council of Public History Consultants Committee, sits on Library and Archives Canada Service Advisory Committee, and is the former chair of the Canadian Historical Association of Public History Group. I was going to continue reading, but I'll take a break from reading and we'll get into the presentations and I'll come back and at the end and I'll read um, uh, the presentation briefing from uh, Mr. Harry Slade. Uh, thank you, Aaron. <clears throat> and uh, I want to thank the um, organizers of this conference for the invitation. Uh, this is an important conference and I'm, I'm glad to be here. Uh, before I uh, start with my presentation, I just want to um, 
acknowledge a comment that was made prior to the break. Um, somebody um, was commenting on the importance of media education in our school system, and I, uh, I must say I fully concur uh, with um, uh, her, her comments. I think she's making the point that uh, everyone should be trying to influence um, their local school boards to ensure that uh, the Mady history um, uh, here in Alberta is taught in our school systems. Now, I was born and raised in Alberta. Uh, I grew up in a small town uh, that's uh, about three hours west of Edmonton. And I had um, an enlightened teacher in grade seven who, in her review of Canadian history, um, introduced us to uh, the uh, history of the Mady in this province. And I can remember uh, very clearly reading um, about Jerry Potts, who is adorning the front page of, um, of um, uh, my presentation. So I just wanted to, to make that acknowledgement. Uh, but I'm, I'm not here to talk about education. In fact, um, I'm the third lawyer you're going to hear about this morning, hear from this morning, and as someone who spends a lot of time with lawyers, I just ask you to be patient. <laughs> um, I've been asked uh, to contribute to the program by speaking about the federal government's comprehensive claims policy and how that policy um, has addressed uh, media rights and aspirations. And of course, the simple answer is that that policy hasn't. Uh, nevertheless, I'm going to talk about the comprehensive claims policy um, uh, from an historical context uh, because I think it's important um, uh, uh, doing that because it should inform uh, the objectives and strategies uh, for the Mady in the reconcil reconciliation negotiations uh, that are currently underway. There are many lessons to be learned uh, from both the historic and modern treaty processes uh, that um, I hope will guide uh, the Mady going forward. So um, I uh, intend to uh, address uh, three areas in my comments. Uh, first of all, um, uh, I'm going to cover 250 years of history in the 30 minutes I've been allotted. Please, please don't be discouraged because th that's normal. Yeah, yes, I see somebody's nodding off already. But this, this is an interesting story, um, and it's and it's a story about treaty making. And there's a common thread linking our earliest treaties to Ottawa's recent emphasis on developing a framework to recognize and implement indigenous rights. And that uh, is going to lead to my sec second topic, and that is how has Canada addressed and accommodated Métis rights and aspirations? And um, I, after I've dealt with that, which will take just a few seconds, I think, to um, address some of my comments, um, I'm going to deal with, I'm going to provide some of my own observations and comments about the recent reconciliation initiative. I certainly believe that Canada's um, uh, pronouncements uh, hold promise for uh, the Mady, and um, I am going to provide you with uh, some gratuitous advice about um, the path forward. First, um, this is a disclaimer. I said this was going to be an interesting story, but regrettably, some of the language isn't. Um, some of you may be wondering, what is a comprehensive land claim? Uh, modern treaties are called comprehensive land claims. From, two, from 1973 um, until last year, Canada implemented the comprehensive claims policy uh, to address the rights and aspirations of Indigenous communities across the, uh, this country. I wanted to get that um, um, out of the way before I introduce um, a chronology of key events, but you'll see that um, uh, the reason for the word comprehensive was because of the um, all-encompassing nature of the uh, uh, negotiations uh, for modern treaties. So going back to this 250-year history I promised to, um, to review, I mentioned a uh, common thread a few moments ago, and that's the Royal Proclamation, Zachary I referred to the Royal Proclamation in his comments earlier this morning. Uh, that's um, an edict that was issued more than 250 years ago that was designed to govern uh, the settlement of British uh, territories in North America. 
Now, starting with the Royal Proclamation, the history I'm going to describe uh, today can be divided into four component parts. And if you can just, with reference to the chronology, uh, scan the period from 1763 to 1921. Uh, that was a period of settlement and development of present-day Canada uh, from the East Coast across uh, Western Ontario, Manitoba, into present-day Saskatchewan and Alberta, uh, to British Columbia and the Northern Territories. Uh, throughout that period, uh, Canada, uh, or the Crown, was guided by the Royal Proclamation uh, in its dealings with the Aboriginal peoples uh, who were being dispossessed of their lands uh, due to the development of uh, the frontier economy. So that's period number one, 1763 <clears throat> to 1921. And these are arbitrary um, uh, periods that um, um, I'm, I'm tracking based on uh, some of my uh, research into this, this area. The second period uh, starts in 1921, and it goes for nearly a half century uh, to 1973. Uh, during that period of time, there was a, a, a disavowal and repudiation by Ottawa of the principles underlying uh, the Royal Proclamation. Uh, treaty making not only came to an end in 1921, uh, but the federal government passed a law in 1927 uh, that prohibited uh, the pursuit of land claims. Um, and just as an aside, I, I don't think enough has been written about this period, and I'm currently researching uh, and intend to write a paper about the federal government's decision to suspend treaty making in 1921 and how we're dealing with the legacy of that uh, decision today. Now, the third period starts in 1973 and goes up until 2018. Uh, that period um, uh, starts with the Nishka Tribal Council's Aboriginal title claim uh, being heard by the Supreme Court of Canada. Uh, in that case, Emmett Hall, on behalf of himself and two other justices of the court, relied on the Royal Proclamation, the thread that runs through uh, this history, in a dissenting judgment that supported the Nishka tribe's Aboriginal title claim. That's the Calder decision. You'll see it um, noted on that chronology. And that decision has had uh, far-reaching implications. Uh, following the release of, um, of Calder, Canada quickly announced the development of two policies in response. Uh, the first being the Comprehensive Claims Policy, which revived treaty making. And the second was the specific claims policy, which uh, Harry Slade was to speak about this morning, but which I understand Aaron is going to be making um, a presentation on later this morning. Um, as we'll see um, uh, in a moment, modern treaty making has mi met with mixed success. And uh, before um, I get to that, I just want to deal with the fourth component of this chronology. And that starts um, last year. We're now entering into a new era in terms of Ottawa's um, uh, uh, efforts to address Aboriginal interests. Last year, <coughs> uh, the Trudeau government announced that the comprehensive claims policy would be replaced by a new initiative based on the recognition and implementation of Aboriginal rights. Now, the specifics of what that entails remain uncertain, uh, but that's where the Métis find themselves today. So that's the overview, and uh, let's go back to the beginning. <coughs> Forgot to mention there's a quiz element to this. <coughs> I'm going to ask who out there knows who this dapper looking fellow is? <coughs> Any guesses? No, it's not Champlain. This is. Um, King George III, yeah, we have a right answer back there. There's uh, a prize to be collected at the end of this. <laughs> king George was the king of Great Britain and Ireland from 1760 to 1820. And uh, 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 interestingly, he was also concurrently the king of Hanover. <coughs> king George III is notorious um, because he suffered from recurrent and eventually permanent mental illness. That's not the reason why we're discussing him today. Um, importantly, from um, Canada's perspective, um, 
uh, King George issued the Royal Proclamation. Um, he did that after Great Britain uh, defeated France in the Seven Years, uh, Seven Years War, and that was early on in his reign. And uh, uh, as, as, a result of, um, as a result of the end of the Seven Years War, Great Britain became the dominant power in both North America and India, and the Royal Proclamation is King George III's legacy uh, in Canada. Zachary um, uh, referred to the Royal Proclamation earlier today. Uh, just uh, some further background. Uh, under the Treaty of Paris, France ceded control of its North American territories to Great Britain. Uh, the Royal Proclamation established a new administrative structure for British North America and acknowledged Aboriginal possession of lands that had not been ceded to or purchased by the Crown. Uh, the Royal Proclamation also prohibited the purchase or sale of Aboriginal lands without the Crown's prior consent. <coughs> the uh, document has been referred to in judicial decisions in the, um, uh, in the Calder case as the Indian Bill of Rights. Others have referred to the Royal Proclamation as the Indian Magna Carta. Uh, the document guided federal policy as the Dominion grew westward across uh, the continent of North America. So, <clears throat> a moment on Canada's historic treaties. So these are the treaties that were negotiated between 1701 and 1921. The earliest recognized treaty in present-day Canada is the Treaty of Albany. Uh, which was concluded between France and the Iroquois Confederacy in the Great Lakes region in 1701. That treaty is one of approximately 70 recognized treaties uh, that were completed between the 18th century and 1921. I think for the purposes of this conference, uh, the numbered treaties are probably the most significant. Starting in 1871 and continuing through to 1921, Canada negotiated 11 numbered treaties across northwestern Ontario, the prairies and parts of British Columbia, Yukon, and the Northwest Territories. Uh, the numbered treaties required the Aboriginal groups to surrender their rights and title to land in exchange for treaty rights, uh, which consisted uh, in the main of uh, the creation of reserves, uh, the preservation of hunting, fishing, and trapping rights. Uh, some of the treaties um, uh, called for the Crown to provide small annuities to uh, the recipients of the treaties, as well as ammunition, twine for fish nets, farm stock and implements for those uh, reserves that were set up um, uh, for the purposes of agricultural initiatives and um, uh, suits of clothing and commemorative coins for uh, leaders of um, uh, the Aboriginal uh, signatories. Now, a gentleman here this morning um, uh, spoke about Treaty 8, and I, uh, I'm going to spend a moment on uh, Treaty 8. I'm not an expert in Treaty 8, and uh, as I think some of the people here may be, but uh, my understanding is that Treaty 8 is the largest treaty by area in Canada. Uh, you can see it on the map. Um, it encompasses parts of present-day Alberta, Saskatchewan, the Northwest Territories, and a part of British Columbia. Um, uh, on the northeast um, uh, border of that province. Um, now, in the mid-19th century, I think it's important to put this into context, uh, that part of the Dominion wasn't considered as valuable as the prairies because uh, it wasn't um, suitable for farming and settlement. That changed, of course, with uh, the Klondike Gold Rush and the discovery of oil reserves and other minerals in the Athabasca Mackenzie area. So uh, Ottawa then turned its attention uh, to uh, the Treaty 8 area um, uh, in terms of treaty making. Uh, from Canada's perspective, uh, the object and purpose of Treaty 8 was to, number one, extinguish Indian title to the Peace River Athabasca districts, and number two, to overcome hostility and resistance by uh, the Aboriginal inhabitants to the frontier economy. Uh, number three, to protect uh, the security and economic interests of settlers 
uh, in the wake of the Klondike Gold Rush, and uh, number four, to offer a protection to Aboriginal inhabitants through guarantees and obligations of a treaty. And um, from Ottawa's perspective, what they thought uh, they were providing to the Aboriginal signatories uh, was essentially a treaty based on uh, peace and friendship that affirmed or recognized their rights uh, to um, continue harvesting activities and as well a guarantee that their traditional economy and freedom of movement uh, would not be affected. So where did Treaty 8 leave the Métis? Um, uh, based on uh, my research, um, uh, it's my understanding, and I know that this conference uh, uh, deals with script, and there are a number of people more knowledgeable than me, but my understanding is that the policy of Indian Affairs was to allow the Métis to decide whether to accept script or accept treaty benefits as Indians. And um, I know others at this conference have addressed uh, the ramifications of the script policy, uh, but there seems to be unanimity among historians that the bargain uh, that Canada offered was designed to part the Métis from their land. In any event, um, the script option was removed by Canada in 1921, and any Métis claims under Treaty 8 after that date, the adhesions to the treaty, uh, were dealt with um, as adhesions to the treaty. Uh, Zachary uh, provided us with a PowerPoint slide of um, uh, an amendment to the criminal code that um, I wasn't aware of that I found fascinating. It certainly is consistent with uh, Ottawa's policy on Aboriginal matters uh, starting in 1921. As I've indicated, in 19, uh, 1921 marked the end of treaty making. Um, as Canada developed, uh, policymakers in Ottawa no longer considered it necessary or expedient to address Aboriginal claims. Uh, in fact, the government of the day was determined to bring an end to treaty making. And uh, you can see, uh, I've got on the screen an amendment that was made to the Indian Act in 1927 uh, that prohibited persons, presumably lawyers, uh, from taking on retainers to pursue claims on behalf of Indian bands and tribes. I, th I think this is a relatively recent part of Canadian history. It is a stunning example of um, uh, what uh, the policy of the federal government was um, in, in the 1920s. Over the next half century, Canada maintained the position uh, that Aboriginal land claims had been extinguished or did not exist, or this concept of Aboriginal title was simply too complicated uh, and too ephemeral uh, uh, to be translated into anything substantive. Now, between 1921 and 1973, uh, there were sporadic but unsuccessful efforts to, to um, resolve uh, long-standing Aboriginal claims, and this um, picked up particularly after the Second World War. Uh, there was a joint committee of the House of Commons and Senate uh, that studied the, the Indian Act between 1946 and 1948 and made a number of proposals, including uh, that an Indian Claims Commission be established to address ongoing Aboriginal grievances. Uh, that didn't happen. Uh, in 1962, the Diefenbaker government introduced legislation to create <clears throat> an Indian Claims Commission, but that um, act died on the order paper. Uh, Lester Pearson, when, uh, when Lester Pearson became Prime Minister in 1963, uh, his government introduced similar legislation, uh, but that too uh, was unsuccessful. It didn't go anywhere. So, continuing my uh, historic overview, I'm going to take you to 1969. Uh, and the white paper in there. I, I would expect our people here in this room who remember uh, the introduction of um, the white paper by the Pierre Trudeau government in 1969. Um, that was the uh, unveiling of a new Aboriginal policy by the government of Canada. 
I have a photograph of a very somber looking Jean Chrétien sitting next to Pierre Trudeau. Uh, Mr. Chrétien was the Minister of Indian Affairs at the time and uh, he introduced a statement by the Government of Canada on Indian policy in the House of Commons. That statement uh, uh, became known thereafter as the White Paper. It advocated the full, free and non-discriminatory participation of Aboriginals in Canadian society by removing references to Indians from the BNA Act and to end the legal distinction between Aboriginals and other Canadians. Um, the White Paper, I think, uh, is, is sort of a, a remarkable initiative. It represented the culmination of federal policy that started in 1921 and the perspective uh, that Aboriginal peoples were a disappearing race. Uh, the policy initiative was met with vigorous opposition from Aboriginal organizations across Canada uh, who considered um, uh, the government's initiative to be an exercise uh, of assimilation and ultimately the Trudeau government did an about face. And uh, why did they do that? Well, I um, am going to now talk about an Aboriginal land claim from the province of British Columbia. So coincidentally, around the same time uh, in 1969 that the Trudeau government introduced its white paper, um, a Aboriginal land claim by the Nishka Tribal Council was winding its way uh, through the courts of British Columbia. Uh, Frank Calder, who was the president of the Tribal Council and who incidentally was also a member of the BC legislature, sought a judicial declaration that the Nishka's Aboriginal title to the Nass Valley had never been extinguished. And you'll see the Nass Valley on the map is a sizable portion of land in northwest British Columbia, uh, just south of the Alaska Panhandle. <clears throat> As I indicated earlier in my comments, uh, the claim ultimately uh, was unsuccessful, uh, but as I mentioned, there was support within the Supreme Court of Canada for the view that the principles underlying the Royal Proclamation continued to apply in those parts of Canada where treaties had never been completed. And of course, um, British Columbia, uh, the vast uh, majority of the land mass in British Columbia has never been subject of a, um, a historic treaty. <clears throat> As I said, the prevailing view at the time of the Supreme Court of Canada's decision was that Aboriginal title claims couldn't be easily categorized or recognized because they involved, and this is a quotation from uh, the very first iteration of the comprehensive claims policy, because Aboriginal title claims involved a bewildering and confusing array of concepts. That changed with the Calder decision. Shortly thereafter, uh, Mr. Chrétien issued a statement pledging Canada's intention to settle land claims through negotiations. So, in 1973, Canada was back in the treaty business. But Canada returned to treaty making with the same objectives as before. Uh, the statement by Mr. Chrétien disclosed that Canada was prepared to provide compensation to Native groups in return for the relinquishment of their interest in lands. And as well, that policy in 1973 um, identified Ottawa's interest in negotiating modern treaties uh, with those communities that were in the path of developments. So that's um, uh, the start of the comprehensive claims process. Um, I'm going to move ahead to 1982 when Canada patriated its constitution and enacted a charter of rights. <clears throat> I think um, this uh, um, is a tremendously significant um, a piece of, our, of Canadian history to Métis peoples who gained the constitutional recognition and affirmation of their rights. I'm going to pause here. When I was doing my research for uh, one of the papers uh, that um, I prepared for the Government of Canada a few years ago, I had access to cabinet documents, which are now public records, uh, where the Trudeau cabinet was grappling in the early late 1970s and early 1980s with how to address or whether uh, to address um, Aboriginal interests in a Charter of Rights. And the prevailing view uh, was that 
uh, of uh, Pierre Trudeau was that no Canadian should have specially constituted, should have specially protected constitutional rights. The fact that Section 35 uh, was enacted, I think, is um, a, a, a tremendous achievement by uh, the Métis and the Inuit and, um, and First Nations. <coughs> um, somebody made the point earlier today, should be people, not peoples, and I, I think Tom was saying that he was relying on uh, legal precepts for his use of the word people. Section 35, you'll note, refers to peoples in the plural, not uh, singular. Uh, in any event, uh, the law is always evolving, um, uh, uh, but the changes in Aboriginal law uh, in the time that I've been a lawyer have been uh, rapid and dramatic. Um, Section 35 was enacted as part of the Canadian Constitution. Uh, before 1982, Aboriginal rights existed and were recognized under the common law, uh, but because they did not have constitutional status, uh, they were vulnerable to extinguishment or regulation by legislation. However, since the enactment of Section 35, Aboriginal rights can't be extinguished except by agreement and can only be regulated or infringed by the Crown uh, where justified. Section 35 doesn't identify the range or nature of Aboriginal rights and the federal government has been content to defer to the Canadian courts to provide guidance on the content, nature and scope of, the, of Aboriginal rights, which is why um, I, I think um, regrettably in a sense um, it's, it's been through the courts that um, uh, Aboriginal rights um, um, have, have, uh, have been provided with some content. Now, since 1982, um, it would be chari charitable to describe Canada's treatment of Métis issues as reactive, even passive. I know others here would say that Canada has been inattentive, indifferent, hesitant or derelict in its constitutionally mandated uh, duties and obligations. Uh, and, and to illustrate, um, <clears throat> one need only consider the federal government's position uh, that uh, the Métis were not Indians within the constitutional scope of Section 9124 of the Constitution Act. <coughs> so, we've got um, uh, a renewed interest in treaty making and uh, the enactment of a Charter of Rights that constitutionally protects uh, Aboriginal rights. Um, uh, that takes me then to a discussion of what um, uh, advances uh, were made through the modern treaty process. Uh, I think uh, I, I made the point that I was going to take a couple of seconds to identify for you how the comprehensive um, claims process has addressed MEDI interests, apart uh, uh, with the exception of negotiations in the Northwest Territories, uh, the comprehensive claims process uh, bypassed the METI. <coughs> and that's obviously troublesome because the comprehensive claims policy represented Canada's primary contribution to the process of reconciliation. <coughs> so, um, in terms of context, um, and, and perhaps to, to um, help you understand um, uh, the pressures of negotiations going forward, <coughs> I'm going to address this issue, this issue. Has the comprehensive claims process been a success for those ab Aboriginal groups who participated? Uh, the answer to that is it depends on who you ask. I know that if um, you spoke to uh, representatives of the Nishka or the Tawasa Nations, uh, they would say that they're immensely proud of their treaties. However, the reality is that the investment of time and money has delivered at best modest results under the comprehensive claims policy. And uh, statistics, I think, um, uh, can be a relevant indicator of uh, the success or failure of government policy 122 claims were accepted for negotiation under the Comprehensive Claims Policy uh, between 1973 and probably 1993. <coughs> and during that time, only 26 final agreements were completed. Some of the tables um, are now entering their third decade of negotiations. 
I don't know. I, I'm a negotiator. I don't know any other form of negotiation that uh, takes longer than a few years. The fact that um, uh, parties um, uh, are um, involved in negotiation decade after decade, I, I think highlights that um, uh, this program uh, didn't meet its expectation. As well, many of the communities that um, uh, decided to give modern treaty uh, making a try have, have given up on the process. And so too, uh, apparently, has Ottawa, and I'm gonna to come to that in a moment. Now, um, I've been involved, as I mentioned, in various kinds of negotiations throughout my career, and I can tell you that in the five years I spent as a chief federal negotiator in the modern treaty process, uh, that, that experience was quite unique. Uh, the process was uh, frustratingly slow, um, progress was elusive, and the results were not uh, particularly rewarding. Uh, from my perspective, and I'd ask you to take that into account as the uh, uh, various uh, Meadey reconciliation tables are moving forward. Um, I wrote, um, I was asked to write a report in 2014, 2015 on renewing the comprehensive claims policy. Um, I, um, I, I led the government's initiative uh, in terms of meeting with um, Aboriginal groups, provincial and municipal governments and other stakeholders. I met with uh, Métis representatives on Ontario, Manitoba with Madame Poitra uh, in Alberta and in British Columbia. And uh, they delivered a consistent message which was that Métis rights and aspirations were not reflected in federal policies and initiatives. And I addressed those concerns in my report. Those were the two recommendations I made. Um, I was criticized by um, some observers for uh, these recommendations. The inference was that I was recommending uh, that the Meiji, um be included within the comprehensive claims process, and that's certainly not true. Um, I, I wasn't doing that. Um, <coughs> you know, clearly if um, any Meiji groups want to engage with the comprehensive claims process, uh, Ottawa should um, um, uh, enable that, but uh, the um, uh, impression that um, I hope to create with those recommendations was that Ottawa's, um, Ottawa was not dealing uh, 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 fairly with, um, uh, with the media in terms of how they're being addressed through this policy initiative. Now, to the government's in, uh, credit, uh, Tom Isaac, who you heard from this morning, was appointed to follow up on those recommendations and he delivered his thoughtful report to the federal government, which he described um, uh, today. So, where does that leave us now? Um, I, I think it was Zachary who showed us the photograph of uh, uh, the Treaty 8 meeting where you had people at the table and people sitting on the ground. You have a seat at the table. Uh, that's a breakthrough, uh, but what does it mean? And. Um, uh, I um, am, am, am going to be. Conc I'm concluding my comments by um, talking about the sort of fourth component in that chronology. We're uh, now moving forward from 2018, and you've got um, a federal government that now says we want to engage in negotiations or uh, discussions to recognize um, uh, Métis rights, and um, uh, we're fully. Uh, committed to the act of reconciliation. So what is reconciliation? Depends on who you ask. Um, studies in Canada, the United States, New Zealand, and Australia have identified three main components to a reconciliation initiative being number one, acknowledgement, a number two, apology, and number three, uh, re redress. So uh, that's sort of a <clears throat> um, a very broad framework of what um, reconciliation entails. And we know that from Canada's perspective, they've identified two streams to um, address uh, their vision of reconciliation. Uh, number one, uh, through the uh, development of a recognition and, and implementation of Indigenous rights framework, and number two, through the implementation of uh, the UN Declaration. Um, 
bold initiatives. Uh, I, I hope, frankly, that the um, there's, that there's substance there. I don't doubt for any moment that uh, Prime Minister Trudeau and Minister Benefit, Minister Bennett, are sincere in their statements about uh, trying to to do things differently and trying to um, address a reconciliation. But I, I think the Métis need to recognize that the same federal system uh, that has denied their rights for more than a century uh, is standing behind um, uh, this government. And I know I'm running out of time right now, uh, but um, uh, here's, here's the gratuitous advice in terms of uh, the negotiations going forward. Um, three piece of, uh, pieces of advice. Number one, figure out your mandate, decide what you want to get out of the process before you start negotiations. That's an obvious piece of advice. But equally important is to understand who you're dealing with. Which of the federal departments and agencies will have an interest in the outcome of the negotiations? That's an important point uh, uh, because you need to have federal representatives at the table who have the authority to represent the diverse interests of the federal government. One of the lessons learned from the comprehensive claims process is that the federal negotiators at the table didn't have the authority to speak for fisheries and oceans, uh, the Department of National Defense, uh, the Department of Environment, or Finance Canada. So when you get to the table, make sure the person on the other side has the authority uh, to deal with all of the federal interests that are engaged uh, by uh, the negotiations. Number two, <clears throat> timelines. Don't get involved, well, unless you want to, don't get involved in a process for the sake of, of process. Set realistic timelines for the completion of negotiations. Somebody mentioned um, the Alberta election that's coming up. There's a federal election coming up this year. I think there's an opportunity over the course of the next several months to try and make um, headway with um, uh, the federal government. Election cycles um, um, can affect uh, the outcome of negotiations and what uh, governments are prepared uh, to, um, uh, to negotiate. So my message is don't get trapped in a perpetual or permanent process of negotiations. Understand what the federal approval process is. Um, cabinet approval is required at several stages of the comprehensive claims process and often those approvals took up to two years to complete, which is unconscionable. It resulted in uh, a, a loss of community support in the Aboriginal communities uh, to their interest in um, uh, negotiations. And number three, this is my last comment, um, have an exit strategy. If the objectives, uh, if your objectives aren't being met in negotiations, know when to leave the process. Um, there's an alternative to negotiations. It's litigation, and frankly, I think the fact that the government has announced that it's not going to be uh, denying Aboriginal rights uh, provides Aboriginal parties with some leverage in negotiations um, going forward. So those are um, my comments. Thank you very much for your attention, and um, uh, again, appreciate being here. Okay, so thank you very much for having me here. Um, thanks for putting me on a panel with lawyers at lunch and um, asking to speak to Métis about their genealogy. This is gonna be a lot of fun. <laughs> so today I'm gonna go over um, Métis genealogy and this is gonna be the challenge because I'm not Métis, and I'm going to speak to all of you Métis about genealogy. So take that within the framework of which it is. 
And then we're going to go over the M&A registry process. I don't work for the M&A, and I don't work in the M&A registry. And we'll talk a little bit about the Métis root families. And then we're going to talk about um, a new M&A registry system. But first, um, even more di disclaimers, and these ones are actually quite serious. Um, this presentation is about a methodology, and um, it's a, a way of approaching things. And as we move through this, you're going to see that I'm working within that colonial framework that Jason talked about yesterday. There's no way for me not to work in that framework. And in some ways, the Métis Nation of Alberta needs to work within that framework. Um, for their political reasons and why I'm on a legal panel to kind of recognize and realize um, rights through this Pauli framework, this government framework that's kind of come through the colonial process. Um, and equally, no history, even though we're talking about registry, we have nothing to do with the M&A registry. Um, that is handled by the exceptional professionals in registry. Um, we have no part of any evaluation or citizen application. So I just wanted to get that straight. So setting the groundwork, um, there is no federal list of Métis. There has never been a federal list of Métis. Um, the federal government um, has done um, exceptional work in quantifying and qualifying um, indigenous organizations um, throughout its history. First, obviously, with um, band lists, created through treaty and status cards, um, and then later through um, when resources were discovered in the North and sovereignty became an issue through the Eskimo disc lists, which are fascinating that um, numbers were assigned because they couldn't spell people's names. You don't want the federal government to keep your registry list. And from what I've heard from all of our Métis clients, that is never, ever, ever going to happen. And there's a lot of sense in that, because as soon as the federal government keeps a list, it decides who gets on the list and who gets off the list, and how they apply criteria to the list. And I think that's why it's so important that Métis organizations um, keep, that, keep the list themselves. But there is a need for a list. There's a need for a list that's established in Pauli. And again, remember, this is within the colonial framework. Um, the key points in this uh, taken from Pauli, the verification of claimant's membership in the relevant contemporary community is crucial since individuals are only entitled to exercise Métis Aboriginal rights by virtue of their ancestral connection to and current membership in a Métis community. It goes on and then it says near the end, um, take into account the value of community self-identification, the need for the process of identification to be objectively verifiable. So to work within this system, we need to be able to prove um, that a Métis person is part of a contemporary community and has an ancestral connection to a historic Métis community. That's the key there. And it has to be objectively verifiable by the government. That is at the heart of why a registry is needed to assert Aboriginal rights within that framework. Problematic, problematic for sure. And the MNA heard how problematic that was in their 2018 um, consultation with staff, with um, harvesters. This comes from the publication available on the MNA's website. Above all, harvesters found it discouraging to have to prove their Métinus to the government of Alberta. To a majority of harvesters, having to prove your Métis ancestry to Alberta via the current policy is essentially asking Alberta to identify Métis people, which has already been done by the MNA. This is all at the heart of Métis genealogy. So this is what a colonial genealogy is. And when we were talking about uh, King George III, this is the type of thing that genealogy was invented for, to trace back to show a hereditary lineage um, to inherit um, rights or land. And that's what's being asked. This is my personal opinion. I don't think this is what a Métis genealogy looks like. I think it's more akin to what Jason pointed out yesterday. I think that's kind of what a Métis genealogy looks like. 
but this in fact is a Métis genealogy. It is a highly interconnected network of kinship networks that bind a community. As Brenda McDougall has called it, a kinscape. It represents more than who is related to whom, but a complete worldview and a people's history. Métis genealogy represents a culture and a tradition. In its natural state, the Métis way of organizing through family and kin, as President Poitra talked about yesterday, the Métis way of organizing through family and kin. It is ever moving and ever evolving. It looks different to different people at different times and is more akin to the natural world than to the colonial requirements to prove ancestral lineage. Within it are stories, the relationships, and the way of life of Métis. If you take a snapshot of that, and this is actually regions one, Region 1's um, community genealogy. This is what Region 1 looks like when we put all the genealogies together. You have a beautiful genealogy. There needs to be a compromise because this is very hard to make objectively verifiable. So this is what we're suggesting. Now I know that looks like the hereditary genealogy that I was talking about, but we've implanted things. Give me a couple minutes and we'll get to those. So the M&A registry process, um, if you haven't been on the M&A's website, they've got a great little fun video that takes you through the whole registry process. It's three minutes, otherwise I would have just played that for you. But there's some essential requirements. First, you have to meet the national definition of Métis. Um, you have to submit a live birth registration or long form birth certificate or a wallet size birth certificate and baptismal certificate. Uh, you need valid photo identification and proof of permanent residency in Alberta. And from my understanding, uh, cell phone bills don't count. But um, what I want to talk, though, is the completed genealogy tracing back to the mid um, 1800s. So you can download this form, and I, I filled it out just to show you the way it looks. Um, basically, the m and registry asks you to fill out this form, and, and you kind of list your father's name and when he was born and where he was born, and your mother's name and where she was born, where they were married, and then you go back through your generations. <coughs> you submit that, and then they have an intake process where they kind of make sure you've got your live form, birth certificate, and all that kind of stuff. And again, this is all to make sure that this is an objectively verifiable registry. But then the genealogists go through and they verify it. These people are absolute experts in Métis genealogy because they've been doing it thousands and thousands of times. They go through this and they know, oh, that's this family and I can pull this file from there and I'm gonna get this person's birth certificate. And they know all these families and family names. But all this takes time. It takes a lot of time to go through because every time that they make sure that one of these um, individuals and the information on it is correct, they put a check mark and they copy the document that supports it to make it objectively verifiable and they put it in the file. So they go through your entire family tree and if you trace, as most of you may trace, quite a few different families and different lines, it can take a considerable amount of time. Sometimes there's errors and they have to do further research and sometimes there's just unknowns that they can fill in the gap. This is not a five minute process to put through an application. On the last census, there was 114,000 people that self-identified as Métis in Alberta. And admittedly, not all of them will apply for citizenship in the Métis Nation of Alberta or be approved. Let's take those numbers for a second. Let's say it takes to get that file in, make sure it's got everything, verify all the genealogy, copy the document, put it in, write a letter corresponding with the person, maybe have multiple correspondence. Let's say it takes two hours to process one person's genealogical file. 228,000 hours to process the Métis in Alberta through registry. A team of 10 people would take 11 years working full time. You don't get Christmas off and you don't get New Year's off. 11 years. Think about that though, how many pages of documentation that would create. So 114,000 people equals about 2,000 banker's boxes. And we know this from doing the work, um, 20 to 30 pages in a file. That's 2,500 linear feet of records 
seven and a half Canadian football fields if you stack it end to end. This is just an enormous amount of data that's being dealt with. Obviously, it's problematic, this process. One, it's paper-based. Um, it's paper-based, and there's a lot of um, degradation of quality of copies based on paper. Um, as you move through it, it's the bloat on the system. And there's also duplicate information, because when I apply to make that file objectively verifiable, you've got to have every document in it. You've got to have all the documents that show who my father is and who his father was. When my brother applies, same documents are going in those files. When my daughter applies, same documents are going in her files. So what we're seeing is that there's documents. Um, it's not unreasonable to think that 10 yards could be taken up with one person census records in some of these files. Risk of missing documents, because at this point, um, creating those objectively verifiable files um, doesn't provide context. What if my grandfather's file um, connected to his father and it used a birth certificate, but in my brother's file it used a marriage certificate? It means that the picture isn't holistic in any of the individual files. It's piecemeal information that's necessary, but again, it doesn't give us an accurate picture of who communities are. It gives us an enumeration of ind individuals. So the solution that we've been working on with the MNA for uh, several years now is the idea of Métis root family lines. And I'm going to explore this a little bit. This is based on two premises. The historic Métis population, while there's no list of them, it is identifiable. It's identifiable through um, script records and um, vital statistic information. We know who the Métis population is for the most part. And working within that Pauli framework, we can identify who the first generation of the families were in a region and then trace all their descendants. Now again, this gets into that colonial box that Jason was talking about. We're dealing with modern day boundaries. Um, we're dealing with dates of effective control, but those are the, that's the box that Pauli's kind of put you in that you have to work within. So let's work within that box and think about this. If we say that a family comes from, let's say, Manitoba, and they settle in Lac La Biche in 1837, it's not the Manitoba family, uh, it's not their ancestors in Manitoba that they're the rude ancestors, it's the first generation that's in Lac La Biche. Then we, we trace all their descendants down. They become the rude ancestor descendants. So the terminology is the rude ancestor is that first generation that's in a region. That's what we're going back to, and that's what will qualify under this Pauli box that we're working within. And then everyone underneath automatically qualifies. And then if everyone underneath qualifies, we can create a Métis family line. Now I will say that you can't marry into Métis based on this. And we'll see something really interesting in a minute. But in this chart, the red are the root ancestors. And then the dark blue are all the um, root ancestor descendants. So now, for anyone to prove their Métis ancestry, you don't need to go back all those generations and provide all that documentation to get to the root ancestor. You just got to get to someone blue, because everyone else is verified. So remember how I said this was quite colonial, but there was some things buried in it? So rather than just prevent this, present the standard genealogy, we've kind of adorned it. And is there a laser pointer on this? So you see these little things, these little dots and stuff? Those are in all the genealogies. And what they represent is every time there's a yellow dot, that person has a record saying that they are Métis. There's a record attached to them in the database that says, yep, this person is identified as Métis. What's equally important and fascinating are the diamonds. So when we see a green diamond, someone has a kinship connection to another Métis family. They have a kinship connection, whether it's godparenting or witnessing another marriage to another designated family. When they have the purple one, they've married into another designated family. You can't see it well. This is just um, you know, a little snapshot. 
you can see all the kinship. You can see all the adornment of um, a culture's kinship represented in it. And if you look at these big charts um, that have been that are being produced, you'll see that they're all like this. They're all colorful with this kinship connections. So the family line research that we've been working on, um, if you don't see your family name on here, speak to Alice at the back of the room who presented <laughs> yesterday. So we'll play a little game. How many family lines do you think we found? Just yell it out. Anyone? For Alberta. 218 for Alberta. And the research is ongoing. 218 we have. Any other bidders? Thousand? Not that high. Oh, good guess. 403. So we'll give you the prize. So right now they've ide we've identified 403 family lines. Um, this is, again, the exercise of tracing back through these kind of structured genealogies. But think back to that graphic. It's actually all one interconnected community. So you may say that, oh, I traced to this family line. We actually had someone um, two days ago say to us, well, you know, I don't see my family line. Could you look at my, my list? And they traced to six different family lines, sorry, seven different family lines in four different areas. And that's just based on one line in their tree. So the next challenge with the historic community is how do you connect the contemporary? So we know what we've done is created a system. We've created um, a customized program that basically imports all of that information. And every person that we have in this system exists as a node, as a circle, as one of those dots in that big graphic that we showed you. And every document ever found that we have is attached to them. All the facts about their life, where they were born, who they married, what they worked at, um, all those documents are, are embedded. We take that, and currently there's about 15,000 people, historic people, and we import it into this new program. And I'll give you just a, a little quick tour of the program. Um, it's set up here, um, and it's hard to see. I apologize for that. But this is just kind of a list of all the 15,000 people. And then these are administrative functions that allow you to manage the family lines and locations associated with them. Um, each individual has a person's page, which is a genealogical page, and it has all kinds of information about which family lines they trace to, where they were born, and then all their life facts, all the facts about that person's um, history. Very similar to Ancestry, if you've ever worked in Ancestry and it has this person's child was born on this date, dot, 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 this is all embedded. What's key to making it objectively verifiable is that every single fact is supported by the primary document that is linked within the system. It is linked once in the system. So rather than my file having the document, or my brother's file having the document, and my sister's file having the document about my grandfather, it's just linked in his profile. The beauty of that is that when my daughter applies, um, that document will already be in her system when she connects into it. How does this help? So we have our root ancestors that we've verified. It prevents that duplication of work that you go through, that you attach to one root ancestor and you trace back further and further and further. You don't need to do that anymore. All you need to do is connect to one person, and then you're automatically connected into the entire system and all the kinship networks that have already been established. Similarly, if we find new kinship, it's automatically updated. So quickly, some implications of the system. Um, this could result in a significant reduction in wait times. This is based on our experience with a, another client. Um, just because instead of the two hours, it's now taking 15 to 30 minutes to process an entire file. Um, you're not connecting and verifying seven levels. You're connecting one, two. Um, again, it is independently verifiable because every single fact has the primary source attached to it. Um, and it can reduce the overall costs with the registry because you're not doing the storage capacity, you're not doing the verification of the same document again. Um, and uh, interestingly, it can now live in one system. Ideally, this system would exist that you could walk into your local and they would have access to it and you could apply for it in more than one place because it's not a paper-based system that lives in a central repository. It lives in the cloud as most things do. 
The benefits of the resource, um, this completely M&A owned. This is not something that we're licensing to the M&A. The M&A has this completely. They have all the research, um, and all the research that they do on this type of stuff goes right into it. It's a single access repository. Um, it's not a genealogical collection that uh, is in one place, and there's something else in another place that they have to go and look for another source. It's all in one source. Um, but perhaps, and I think this is one of the most significant things for harvesters and other individuals looking to trace uh, use if we, when we use this system, it identifies all known connections. So just because of the sheer size and um, the way a paper-based system works is that you're looking to get uh, your citizenship. So you find a Métis ancestor, and as we know, many of you have multiple different Métis ancestors that you can trace to. But this isn't dependent on one line that you fill out and that is verified, um, or two lines or three lines. Instead, you're connecting into that large network, that big genealogy, the Métis genealogy, I'm going to start calling it. You connect into that, so that would be your one connection, but it automatically identifies all your other connections and automatically identifies um, which family lines you're tracing to, which has significant implications um, as you move forward with harvesting on harvesting areas because you're no longer tracing to a family in region one, but maybe region one and region four, et cetera. I know there's some archivists in the room, so those are all the images that I used. Thank you. All right, before we move into questions, I just have the um, uh, uh, presentation kind of briefing that uh, Mr. Slade was supposed to be presenting. So I'll read that and then we'll get into questions. Um, so overview, and, and again, this isn't my work, so I'm not sure if I'll be able to answer any questions you have on it, but there's probably people in the room that can. So here's an overview of his intended presentation. Re, a framework for recognition of Métis rights and aspirations. One, the sine qua non of negotiations, the power to compel. Two, Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples, recommendation number 2.4.29 federal, companion legislation to a new royal proclamation providing for the establishment of an independent administrative tribunal to be called the Aboriginal Lands and Treaties Tribunal. Three, lessons learned, the specific claims tribunal Canada. Discussion, number one, negotiation and the power to compel. Negotiation is the process by which consensual resolution of uncertainty, uncertainty over conflicting interests or different perspectives on what may be a common interest may, may be resolved. Where questions over legally enforceable interests exist among people who have a common interest in reconciliation, negotiation is preferred to litigation. Such is the case with tensions between Indigenous interests and rights and the interests of Canadians generally, Indigenous included. I assume good intentions on the part of all participants in the process in, in place that seek resolution of questions over Indigenous interests including Métis and the Crown as represented by governments. But compromise towards consensus can be elusive. So resort may be taken to the law as a means of exercising the power of a party to achieve the desired outcome by means other than negotiation. Take, for example, the negotiation of claims under the Federal Comprehensive Claims Policy. Indigenous land rights are grounded in a collective title, Aboriginal title. Ownership and control are at stake if declared by a court that the claimant owns and controls the title, land and government powers to control the use of land and resources in the interest of the general public are constrained. Governments represent the public interest. The loss of control of the land and resources impairs the power to act in the public interest. In Manitoba, Métis Federation v. Canada, 2013, Supreme Court of Canada, 14, 2013-1 SCR 623, the Supreme Court of Canada held that the Métis were entitled to a declaration that the Federal Crown failed to act with diligence in implementing 
the land grant provisions set out in Section 31 of the Manitoba Act in accordance with the honour of the Crown. The Court further held that the ultimate purpose of the honour of the Crown is a reconciliation of pre-existing Aboriginal societies with the assertion of Canadian sovereignty. Where this is at stake, the Court held it requires the Crown to act honourably in its dealings with the Aboriginal peoples in, ca in question. In relation to Métis rights, the power to compel the desired outcome in, the, in contrast to that of a declaration of title to an Indigenous territory is unclear. The extent to which courts may enforce good faith negotiations as a remedy grounded in the honour of the Crown is unknown. Number two, Royal, Com Royal Commission on Aboriginal, Aboriginal Peoples, RCAP 1996. From RCAP, people to people, nation to nation highlights from the report of the Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples, recommendation 2.4.32 follows a discussion of the recommended power to establish an independent tribunal with oversight power, powers over negotiations toward the resolution of claims. The Commission recommends that the tribunal be established by federal statute operative in two areas, A, settlement of specific claims, B, treaty making, implementation and renewal processes. In Australia and New Zealand, legislation has been established, has established tribunals with broad powers which enable the presentation of claims and the facilitation of negotiated resolution. These tribunals have powers to bring the necessary parties together and exercise oversight over the process of negotiation. This includes ensuring that the parties are diligent in doing the work needed to ground respectful and responsive dialogue and proposals towards the resolution of the many questions that arise. They may also make as bodies independent of government reports to the public on progress and impediments to progress. RCAP recommended action to create such a tribunal over 20 years ago, except as discussed below, it has not happened. Number three, the specific claims tribunal. <clears throat> Legislation establishing the specific claims tribunal was enacted in June 2008. The Specific Claims Tribunal Act SC 2008 C 22 provides for superior court justices serving as members of the tribunal. For information on the powers, processes and decisions of the tribunal, it's available on the following website www.sct-trp.ca/hom/indexe underscore dot htm Decisions of the tribunal and the validity of claims before it and compensation when awarded are binding on both the claimant and the Crown. Claims vary in com complexity but do not approach the level of complexity that must be resolved to address the many fa facets of the relationship that must be addressed to bring about an honourable resolution of Indigenous and Métis relations with the Crown as represented by Government of Canada and the provinces. Therefore, a tribunal mandated to advance these negotiations would not have the power to determine the outcomes. These would be achieved through negotiation. The existence of an independent tribunal with the authority recommended by RCAP would, however, empower the parties in the process of negotiation by holding all of their commitment to pursue a resolution and the Crown to acting in accordance with the precept of the honour of the Crown. Honourable Harry Slade, QC Chairperson, Specific Claims Tribunal, Canada. So now we will go to questions. I'm Lewis Bellrose from the Peace River Country. Gruard, hometown. I, uh, I have a question for Mr. Eford. In all your dealings with the Aboriginal laws, um, land claims, or whenever you deal with a specific group of uh, Aboriginal people, did you ever run into a case where language was an issue in law? Because I often wonder, when Treaty 8 was signed, I don't know if it was uh, 
any lawyers there or anything, but uh, I know Cree was used that day, uh, according to my forefathers. They told me a lot of it, there was an interpreter. A lot of it was in Cree because none of the uh, Aboriginal people could talk English. Some of them talked a little bit French. But, uh, in, uh, because uh, I think it's an important issue on account of uh, the, the dealings we're having with the Métis, you know, in our language. Uh, I guess that's the question I have. I have one other thing before you... Uh, uh, well, I'll tell you after. Oh, you go ahead. <laughs> Yes, and, uh, and indeed, um, uh, that is an issue that I have come across in um, my review of matters. I talked about the uh, historic treaties that were negotiated from 1701 until 1921. And um, I made the point in the report that um, I wrote that many of those treaties, uh, well, all of the treaties, sorry, were written in the English language and were not written in the language of the Aboriginal um, uh, parties. So that is an issue, and I've often wondered uh, whether some lawyer someday is gonna take a run at um, one of the historic treaties on the basis that it constitutes an unconscionable transaction. That's a, a legal term, but a transaction that may not have been understood by the signatories at, at the time. And those historic treaties continue to apply uh, today. So uh, that is an issue uh, indeed that I've come across. Um, I, I'm going to now go to, to modern treaties, and um, I, I made the point that some of the treaty tables are entering their third decade of negotiations. Well, of course, that wasn't the case for the historic treaties. Many of those treaties were completed in the course of a day or two of meetings. So, um, yeah, you know, I think that the issue of um, uh, the facility in the English language of some of the sing signatories is um, something that has been noted uh, by many people, including myself. Uh, one of the treaty negotiations I have been involved in uh, was uh, um, in a tiny remote um, uh, reserve uh, uh, that would be about a three-hour drive from Prince George. And I know the chief of that community uh, was somebody who uh, was quite insistent that um, his language um, inform the content of the treaty. I'm not sure what's happened uh, since. But thanks for the questions. Thank Important you very point. much for the answer. Um, the, the one, uh, <coughs> well then I'll ask you for a job now because I need a job you know. <laughs> <laughs> as an interpreter. <laughs> um, no, uh, the script in Gruard, there was two young men, they got each a script. I don't know how many years ago, 75 years ago. My friend just informed me about it, Mr. Rosie over here. Uh, so they each got a script from the land office. And uh, I want to tell you the story so we could figure out what, what was the outcome of that uh, script, the paper. Everybody seems to be confused. What was it for and everything? But anyway, they each got one. They're brothers, and they're both very athletic. And they said, we'll race for it. Whoever won the race will keep the, the two scripts. So I was just wondering, what, what was their idea about the script, I wonder? Monetary or, you know, it's something to think about. <laughs> That's all, thank you very much. Thank you. So just to give you a little history, first of all, my name is Billy Gibosh, and I'm still an alcoholic. <laughs> uh, just to give a brief his, uh, history of, of my maternal gra grandparents, is uh, my grandfather was identified as Métis and he married a lady who was identified as Treaty. 
so she lost her treaty rights. Eventually, Grandpa passed away, and my mother was born a Métis. My grandmother then married into a reserve. Then she became treaty, but we were still identified as Métis. Later on in, in years, I, I'm not sure what bill it was, Bill C-31, where people could get back their treaty rights. Uh, we were still Métis through all this. And then one day, my mother decided to see if she could apply for her treaty rights, which eventually she did get her treaty rights. So one day out of, out of the blue, uh, not coached, but I was, I was sort of convinced that it made a good point that I should apply for my treaty rights because of my background. I got a letter back saying, well, you're not Indian enough. And I'm saying to myself, well, okay, I'm not Indian enough, but yet the government of this country is not recognizing me for my right either. So where the heck am I? So my question here in short is, can a person whether it's here in this room being Métis or an indigenous person in this country, but more specifically for where we are, can a person be identified both as treaty and Métis? So That's the consensus. And I'm okay with that. I'm okay with that. That I don't have a problem with. But that was my question. Can we be identified as Treaty and Métis? And the history is the indigenous people don't want us and the white people don't want us. Pardon my identification. But so so I, can, I, can, I can take a crack at answering that. So first, first off, first and foremost, people are free to identify themselves however which way they see themselves. True. Right? Um, the second component though, when registering to become a citizen of the Métis Nation of Alberta, we actually do um, a check with the INAC registry. And if you are a registered Indian under the Indian Act, you're not able to be a citizen of the MNA. And I'm okay with that. Okay. I mean, either way it went, I'm okay with that. Uh, first, the other thing I wanted to say is this morning I made a reference to the immigration people. And uh, personally, I, I, I don't have anything against the immigration people that, that are coming into this country. And I want to, and I apologize personally to a young lady sitting over there, pardon my pointing, she's not listening. <laughs> <laughs> I want to apologize to her for identifying her and sending her out. But I also want to let everybody know, we all know immigrants, and I have nothing against them. I welcome them with open arms just like we did way back when in the 1800s. Okay. Jeanette Hansen, Medicine Hat. Um, I really appreciate, Ryan, your presentation and where the m and is going with the registry. Um, my question is, um, a lot of us are in possession of historical documents and I'd like to know how we can protect them because I feel that they should be in Métis control. I could give it to our archives, uh, the museum in Medicine Hat. Um, they actually asked for uh, pictures and archival documents because they didn't have anything and we've got a long, rich history there. So when I put it out to our Métis community, they were just inundated with pictures and they did this wonderful display of who the Métis were in Medicine Hat. But my question is, and when you talk about, you know, these documents covering football fields, how are we going to protect our information, our historical documents, and keep it in our possession? Um, it, it's a great question because with so many programs, as soon as you start the digitization process, it becomes public record. Um, and that's something you do want to be careful of because when it becomes public record, who can use it against you, right? For whatever reason they may. But it's also at risk of uh, deterioration and environmental conditions that could just destroy it. So I think digitization is key. and 
There's a young lady sitting at that table right there, Catherine. She works at Library and Archives Canada. Um, Library and Archives Canada has a new initiative that they've worked out with the Métis National Council um, that they are prioritizing the, di in the digitization of indigenous material for that exact reason. And to my understanding, there's no uh, requirement to make it publicly available. So I think as an organization, you can speak to them about that because it's now a mandate of theirs. Okay, and just to be clear, the m and doesn't have like a, an archival library to keep these documents? I, I can't comment on m and but I'd love yeah. to see your documents in the system at some point. <laughs> okay, thank you. So, so yeah, uh, Jeanette, we do have our genealogical resource center where we do keep um, historical documents at, at the head office. So if we have like original, um, like photographs, um, documents of the script, of the um, certificates of land yep. entitlement. And yep. Yep. We you could take care of those. Happily. Okay. Thank okay. you. So we'll take um, the two more, uh, or three more, three more at the mic, and then we'll go to the live feed. I'm Sky Blue Morin from uh, the Morins of Green Lake, Saskatchewan. And uh, I give thanks to Métis Nation of Alberta for accepting me at their conferences to learn. <laughs> um, I'm responding to uh, the previous question before we took a break about languages. Um, I've been um, writing, uh, teaching, Conversing, translating Machif uh, with Region 3 uh, from the Métis Nation of Alberta, and I'm hoping to encroach on all the other regions. <laughs> That's a joke. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I write in English phonetics. Someone was saying uh, something about why are we not learning this. I write in English phonetics because that's what kids are learning in school. And little kids are able to pick up what we teach because they're reading the English language in Machif. Um, I just wanted to add to the previous speaker to uh, a lot of books, Métis books, are getting very valuable. Uh, Dr. Ann Anderson's uh, uh, Machif Dictionary, um, I believe now is worth like $200. Like we have, to, we have to hang on to these documents and we have to store them somewhere. I, I have her original copy from 1975, but I've used it so much it's not worth the $200. I just <laughs> use it as a resource document. Uh, but those are some of the things we have to watch out for is not to let those books slip out of our fingers to uh, store them somewhere. Um, and the other thing is uh, I'm here to make a public service announcement too. <laughs> The government gave out a bunch of money for a Machif language. Um, I'm not able to apply for it myself as an individual person or writer. I have to go through an agency or uh, like a Métis region or Métis local. Um, but one of the things is um, we need to write letters to the school boards that we want Machif taught in our schools. Um, I've been approached to translate some elder stories um, in the Red Deer Rocky Mountain House area. And I'm talking with the school division there because I'm not ju just gonna translate. I want those in there. I want those documents for kindergarten, grade one, grade four, grade five, to be able to read uh, a story, a hunting story or a trapping story about an elder from their community. And we need to get those stories from our Métis people. There are only 60 uh, Machif language speakers that are fluent in the province of Alberta. And the one uh, meeting I came to in June last year, the government was co consulting on languages. Um, uh, a lady from Region 1 had mentioned that she would like to see a conference of these 60 
fluent speakers. And I just want to put that on the table again, that we need that conference, we need to meet those 60 fluent speakers, and I'm one of them, so there's 59 more you have to find. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks a lot. Hi. My name is Darcy McRae, and I support the Region 3 with some genealogy and Métis history. And there were some points that I just see gaps in some of the presentations that are occurring. And one of them is specific to language, just to build on what Sky Blue had just made comment to, is there's a record uh, going back all the way to 1823 with Governor Simpson of the Hudson Bay Company. If you were going to work for them, you needed to sign a civility and morality clause which stated you would not speak your indigenous language to neither your wife nor your children. That was the loss of our language way before Canada became a country, way before residential schools. But this is stuff that's not really well presented or discussed. Um, and then going back and looking at some of this, I've been advocating or wanting to do, we have our root ancestors. We know who our Métis Nation is. All we have to do is turn that census and those records around and do a reverse census. We won't get everybody, but we'll know back to at least our grandparent and we'll be able to connect to all the rest of those links to verify and prove our Métis uh, connection. Now the problem with that is also that in 1870 when Manitoba was coming into Confederation and the Métis brought Manitoba into Confederation, the government sent an army in and it was again, they're advertising it as to keep the peace. But it was not the peace that was kept. They sent in the Red River Expeditionary Force and the reign of terror began in the city of Winnipeg where the large central location of Métis people were. Now that reign of terror is also what severely damaged our culture. When you got the army walking around looking for anyone who's wearing a sash or beaded work or speaking their language, that would have identified you as a Métis person and made you a target. So that too undermined our culture, is having that brute force come in and oversee our community. So having said that, again, people say, well, identity is so important to be Métis. How can you identify or be a Métis if you don't identify as Métis? Well, if the army were to walk in this door right now and they had guns pointed at all of us, we would become quickly whatever they wanted us to be. We would be Filipino. Asian. We'd be whatever got us away from that gun. And that is what ripped our communities apart. And then to build on that, I'd also say that within the treaties, the context of the treaties, including Treaty 1, which is in Manitoba, you've got in the texts of all of the number treaties, so it'll say we signed it with, well, I'm just going to say off the top of my head, say the Swampy Crees and the Soto, and other Indians who inhabited the territory. And that text is in Treaty 1, Treaty 2, Treaty 3, Treaty all of them. So my question is, was it the Indians who signed for the other Indians in the territory? Or was it the government who signed for the other Indians in the territory? Either which one, it's not the people who are living there. So that's a basis for a legal challenge right there as well as the 1.4 million acres set aside in Treaty 1. You've got a legal document there that's supposed to be and is recognized as legal. But in 2016, the Daniels ruling and the recognition of the Métis there got us, or sorry, 2013 land rights uh, victory, shows 1.4 million acres of that land is Métis land. Therefore, to me, and again, I've said this a number of times, that makes Treaty 1 illegal. You put the wrong date on a contract, that's not legal. You put the wrong name, that's not legal. So having 1.4 million acres in Treaty 1 territory that was signed away, kept away from the Métis for 150 years, then they go, oh, geez, we made a mistake. Yeah, you guys have 1.4 million acres of that land. My assumption of that would be that would make Treaty 1 illegal. And if Treaty 1 isn't there, because Treaty 2 wraps around Treaty 1, well, Treaty 2 would fall. Treaty 3 wrapped around, they would all fall. And that's just, again, my perception of that. But I do believe Treaty 1 is illegal. 
Um, and I also was here for the Daniels Conference a few years back, and at the time I said the same thing. Canada's economies are all based off the Métis homeland, with the first being fur trade. The Métis were the most important people to the fur trade. We were the fur trade. The next economy that came along was on our land again, which was agriculture. They came in, they took our land, they set up the agriculture, and dominated economically through that land. Now the third largest economy that's occurring in this country is resource development. Again out here in Western Canada on the Métis homeland. I don't understand why this is not being acknowledged or recognized. The Métis are creating the economy of Canada and have been since day one. Anyways, that's my points. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I just I just have a question for the, the genealogy guy, <laughs> and uh, please help me. No, I'm just <laughs> kidding, but um, so um, I, I I'm disenfranchised, right? So I, I understand that I'm Métis, and I'm also Treaty, and uh, but because I don't have a Métis card and I don't have a, a Treaty card, I'm neither, right? So. Um, I, I come from uh, like one of those those places that was rescinded, right? And um, I'm in a process now. I'm, I'm 38. I'm kind of like regaining my identity finally, but it, it has a lot to do with everything that was talked about today, even the you know um, Indian residential schools and the effects of that and intergenerational trauma, all those things. Like it's uh, so. Being displaced, the way I describe it is that I'm one of many, and I'm kind of like an urban Indian right now. And the idea is, is that we blow around in the wind here in the city, right? We don't really have any connection to where our roots come from. And uh, I, I, I had a woman do a genealogy for me, but it was years ago, and her name was Joanne Wagner. And I understand that she did my genealogy. She dropped it off at the Métis Nation and then she passed away. So all I knew is that it was dropped off there and then when I went and tried to uh, access that information, I, I wasn't able to receive it because I didn't have my mom's birth certificate. And see, because of that, I was uh, in foster care for a long time and um, I wasn't ever raised with my mother and uh, like I was taken from her and my father when I was four years old. So the problem is, is that uh, because you're so disenfranchised and because you're blowing around in the wind so much with genealogies and, and being able to even just prove who you are, right? Like it, it, it's, it, it's hard to just, like if I have to get my mother's birth certificate, because I have not a real connection with my mother, she's alive and everything, it means that I have to take her to court. And get, you know what, I, I don't wanna take an old woman to court you know what I mean? It just, it doesn't feel morally right for me, you know? Like, um, so th there, there's many questions that I have about genealogy, but also at the same time, just, you know, the, the connection to where I am. Like, I know I'm from there. I live there. I walk there. I, you know, I, I'm from there, right? Like, it's, and, you know, even my uncles, one of my uncles was the president of the Métis Nation, the Zone 2 Regional Council, right? And I grew up, and I, I even had one of those Métis cards, but then they, they changed the Métis card. So you, you, those Métis cards don't count anymore or something. So it, there's, a, there's a lot of questions I have when it comes to genealogy. And, and yeah, it's been a while since I've tried to be Métis or I've tried to be Treaty, you know, like, so it's, it's just uh, some questions that I have about, you know, identity, right? So thank you. Thank you very much for those. Uh meaningful comments um, yeah, um, so as far as having access to documents over the last probably what Terry six months or so we've we've been we've been able to work closer with vital statistics they've actually changed I believe some of their legislation and we can that painful step that a lot of people don't want to take in f getting their parents birth certificate or whatever uh, we now have a process that we can work with people 
um, on an individual basis to get that actual linking document. Um, so what I maybe at lunch I can link you up with our, our head genealogist over here, Terry, and we can you guys can talk about that process a little bit. Okay. All right, we'll go for to the live feed for a few questions. Um, so Desiree asks, what would a national Métis registry database look like, and would it make registry easier or harder? <laughs> I've never heard of any uh, Métis organization looking at a Métis national registry right now, so I wouldn't be able to comment on that. Yeah, so, and I'll just further comment, it, it is the position of the Métis Nation Alberta that there be a provincial Métis Nation citizenship registry just for Alberta Métis, not for a national one. Any other questions from live feed? No? All right, one more big round of applause for our panel. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Um, for those of you that are participating in the talking circle this afternoon, if you want to just link up with uh, Marilyn Dumont here, she's standing, and just so everybody can introduce each other, and she'll be moderating it. So if you'd do that, that'd be greatly appreciated. Thanks a lot. We'll be back here at exactly 2 o'clock for lunch, or after lunch. Thanks.